The last few seasons of anime rank among the best ever for exciting new series premieres, but this summer, long-awaited sequels are where it's really at. After a literal decade away, reverse isekai comedy classic The Devil is a Part-Timer has finally returned. And between that, regular Isekai Overlord 4, and I can't believe it's not Isekai Don Machi 3, we've got sequels covering the whole Isekai spectrum. Classroom of the Elite and Utawari Rumono are also back from a long absence. Shadow's House and Love Live Sunshine from a slightly shorter one. Rent a Girlfriend's given me a new excuse to roast it. And last, but certainly not least, Maiden Abyss Season 2 has finally arrived! But don't let all those great returns and revivals stop. You forgot Tokyo Mew Mew New. <laughs> no, I didn't forget. It's on the list. That's a reboot. That totally counts as a new anime, which I just watched all the ones of, so you don't have to. And now I made a list of the 10 best ones of those, which admittedly aren't as good as the best ones from spring or winter, but there's still some really great stuff in there, and I kind of like having the extra room to recommend trash. And Tokyo Mew Mew New? Right! Totally! These are the ones to watch for Summer 2022. Sponsored by Opera GX, the only web browser built for gamers. I should probably clarify what this means because this is far more than the regular browser with RGB lighting you're probably imagining. Opera GX gives you control over how much power, RAM, and bandwidth the sites you're browsing can use, ensuring that all the precious resources your games need to run at their best get where they need to go every time, even when you have like 50 wiki tabs open. It's an absolute godsend for PC gamers, but they had otaku in mind when they built this thing too. Not only do Opera GX's custom themes let you precisely match the color palette of your anime slash waifu desk setup, you can fill the browser background with any anime pick, or regular pick for that matter, of your choice. Or you can use some of the fancy animated wallpapers on Opera add-ons. I particularly like this gorgeous One Piece piece. Plus, if you want to add some music to tie the whole theme together, you don't even need to leave your browser. Spotify, Apple, and YouTube Music are all integrated right into the sidebar, and they even pause and resume automatically whenever you play a video. But on that note, Oh man, what this browser can do with videos has got to be the coolest part. Opera GX lets you pop out any streaming video player into a floating, adjustable frame that follows you from tab to tab, so you can binge your way through the One Piece dub or watch your favorite streamer while you work, study, or just as an example, hunt for images to use in the thumbnail of this very video. Easy as clicking a button. Best of all, Opera GX makes it just as easy to bring all your browsing data, bookmarks, and cookies over from your old, dusty, non-gamer browser using their quick import tool. So there's nothing stopping you from making the jump. Use my link below to download Opera GX today. Big thanks to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, on with the anime. And because I love segues, let's kick the list off with an anime for gamers, Yure Deco, the latest show from experimental anime powerhouse Science Saru, and the directorial debut of longtime Masaki Yuasa collaborator Tomohisa Shomomiya. The series is set in a futuristic world where everyone has implants in their eyeballs called decos that allow them to both full dive into virtual reality and augment real reality with 3D decorations of their choosing, hence the name, and also, uh, because everyone has cameras in their eyes now, the world has turned into a total social surveillance state, purely by coincidence, I'm sure. In keeping with that, all currency has been replaced with love, the show's word for social media likes, which you need a heck of a lot of to afford VR avatars and AR decoration themes with any degree of pizzazz. In pursuit of this precious social capital, our heroine, an average girl named Barry with some hacker skills, sets out to find evidence of a mysterious urban legend e-celeb named Zero who purportedly has the power to take people's love away, and ends up falling down a warp pipe of even deeper mysteries with a group of strange digital misfits called the Ghost Detectives Club, who live in the glitchy fringes of this digitally enhanced city. It's a fascinating and 
prescient sci-fi concept built around some really solid characters, but that's not the main reason you're going to want to watch this show. As a science Saru production, Yure Deco is naturally possessed of a distinct and striking visual style that comes part and parcel with bouncy, beautiful animation that pushes the boundaries of digital augmentation at every turn in ways no other anime studio would even dare. The vibes in Science Saru anime aren't always completely immaculate, true innovation is often a little janky, but they are always quite unlike anything else you'll find in any other anime, and Yure Deco is no exception to that rule. Now, if a truly immaculate vibe is what you seek, then you, my friend, need to heed the call of the night. Ko Yamori was getting along pretty okay as middle schoolers go. He had friends, good grades, even a girl who liked him. Just the sort of thing the typical boy he was pretending to be to maintain all of those things would be stoked about. But Ko is anything but typical. He's not really interested in girls at all, or boys for that matter, which would have at least been something that his classmates and the girl he reduced to tears by rejecting her could understand. He doesn't really even understand himself. How could he when he has to spend every day pretending to be someone else? So he quits pretending, quits school, and slips out quietly, so no one at home will notice, into the dead of night. Not long after, on a street curb bathed in the blinding glow of concerningly accessible underage drinking, he has a chance encounter with an aloof and mysterious pink-haired tummy, whose anarchic, free-spirited attitude and tummy give him his first real tummy of thigh freedom, and oh shit, is she drinking him? So, uh, yeah. Turns out Nazuna Nanakusa is a bit of a vampire. Sadly, not of the evil golfing variety, but she's still pretty cool, all things considered. And she gives Ko a much-needed push out of his shell. She's sort of like a chiller, less horny Haruhara Haruko. Actually, in a lot of ways, Call of the Night feels like an unconventional lo-fi remix of Fooly Cooley's punk rock journey through puberty, albeit with a low-key shaft energy in place of all that gynax, courtesy of Monogatari director Tomoyuki Itamura, who is now on his third vampire thing after that and Vanitas, and honestly, the experience shows. The vibe here, as I said, is simply immaculate. Stunning starscapes in nebula colors hang low above the eerily empty streets of Tokyo, the whole city transformed into the world's largest liminal space in the cold light of the moon, which spotlights our protagonists as they dance through those empty streets to the lo-fi beats of their own drums. If you've ever felt the refreshing bite of a cool summer's night alone in the city, then you already know exactly why you need to watch this anime. And if not, uh, did I mention the tummy? Oh, sh uh, shoot, halt all dirty talk. This is not a drill. We have a cinnamon roll inbound. The next one to watch is the Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting. And if you bring so much as one dirty thought within 30 feet of this show and its adorable co-protagonist, I promise you will not live to finish it because Yaika Sakuragi is the precious daughter of a powerful Yakuza boss, and on top of that, in order to instill his right-hand man, Toru the Demon of Sakuragi Kirishima, with a slightly greater sense of responsibility and the value of human life, said boss has assigned that guy, who can do this to two other guys in the space of one red light, green light round, to babysit her. Now, obviously the punching of dudes takes a backseat here to the whole fish out of water comedy bit of a big tough crime guy trying to raise a kid, and to the supplementary touching emotional bits where he and that kid help each other open up about the troubles of growing up in the Yakuza and learn to overcome their differences and trauma and all that good heartwarming dad anime stuff, but just as obviously it is still an element in the show, and the level of brutal cartoon violence they put on display here definitely sets the Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting apart from similar stories with similar themes. You know, just gives it a bit of an edge. Not too much edge, though. Just enough to lend the carefully balanced bittersweetness of the whole affair some extra bite. 
And it is a serious testament to the writing and directing skills of Kawasaki Itsuro that all of these different ingredients are able to come together without clashing. If you're looking for an anime that'll give you a good laugh and a good cry in close proximity this summer, The Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting is your best bet. That said, it's not the only anime this summer that attempts to blend fluffy sweetness with violent darkness, or even the only one that succeeds. Smile of the Ars Notoria can best be described as Kaon at Hogwarts. The series follows a group of cute girls doing cute things, often over tea and scones in a cozy little club room, as they live their daily lives in Ashram Academy City, a mystical finishing school that teaches fine young ladies like them how to cast spells the same way they do everything else, with poise and grace. On the script writing side of things, I can assure you that the group of cute girls in question contains more than enough personality to make watching them all drink tea and eat scones for 10 minutes legitimately entertaining television, which few Moe shows other than k can really claim. And on the production side of things, I mean, you're looking at the same fun, expressive character designs I am. You see those backgrounds, that architecture, the spell sakuga and cutesy critter animations. It is all but impossible to lay eyes on this show without being completely and utterly charmed by it. That is, right up until the last two minutes of the pilot, when suddenly we're in a battle scene that wouldn't feel out of place in Overlord. The thing that gives all truly great school slice of life shows emotional weight is the unavoidable truth that the good times can't go on forever. In Kaon and Azumanga Daio, that truth takes the form of graduation, which looms large over the cast throughout the whole series. Apparently, in Smile of the Ars Notoria, this evil wizard night squad is going to fill that role, and whilst I am certainly going to enjoy all of the cute things these cute girls get up to in the interim, I honestly cannot wait to see how all of that pops off. In a similar vein, only with coffee instead of tea and more metallic, explosive wands, Lycoris Recoil features two cute girls popping off shots like John Wick and Rambo, respectively, as they do secret corporate death squad things together, buddy cop style. Bright, cheery Chisato and gloomy, distant Takina are both Lycoris, agents of DA, short for direct attack, not district attorney, who live undercover as sleepers within the schoolgirl population of Tokyo until they're activated to take down terrorists, weapon smugglers, and other threats to the city and nation. Despite being co-workers, the two really couldn't be more different. Takina is a no-nonsense, loose cannon sort of secret police assassin who hates bullshit and red tape and does, in her eyes, whatever needs doing to get the job done. Safety and OPSEC be damned. As for Chisato, she actually doesn't really play by the rules either. The cafe they both work out of is sort of a dumping ground for the organization's misfits, but she does at least care care about preserving life on the battlefield wherever possible, for her allies and enemies alike. Which is why she's out of favor with the assassin agency, despite, in all other respects, literally being John Wick. Note that I didn't say waifu John Wick, because Keanu already is the most precious of waifus, although Chisato might actually be even more precious because she's able to deliver that sweet street justice with an even sweeter smile and a cute little bow on it. Now, you might be wondering how a cute moe girl modeled after a professional assassin noted specifically for the brutal, lethal efficiency of his fighting style would go about preserving human life at all, and the answer to that question is armor-piercing rubber bullets, which is... I really hope I don't have to explain what's stupid about that, like, even by anime standards, but that silly little plot device is what allows the show's action scenes to look like this, so I'm willing to let it slide. Besides, the spy thriller intrigue that forms the backbone of the series' overarching plot is intelligently written and full of clever little twists and turns, and... That's what really counts for making this sort of story satisfying. If you demand only the pulse-poundingest of action in your anime, then Lycoris Recoil is the show to keep an eye on this summer. 
It's not the only show, though. Engage Kiss is a high-octane battle anime set in an independent city-state on a futuristic megafloat that happens to have a slight, uh, demon infestation problem. To help solve that problem, a whole cottage industry of independent demon-hunting contractors has sprung up, whom the city hires on a lowest bidder basis. And no one bids lower than our story's hero, Shu Ogata, who's constantly broke on account of how he hates working bullshit jobs and only takes the most dangerous gigs the city has to offer at half price which he can just barely afford to do thanks to the secret weapon that's sneaking her hand into his back pocket, Kisara, a pink-haired sweetheart who just so happens to be an obscenely powerful demon herself and also completely obsessed with him, which is very convenient for the both of them because her obscene powers are powered by, uh, other obscene stuff. Now, sloppy makeout fueled magic isn't exactly a new concept in anime, but what makes Engage Kiss a particularly fun example of the trope, aside from its slick aesthetic and cool, well-directed action scenes, is that Kisara and Shu are forced to do their magic PDA in front of the demon-hunting crew of Shu's ex-girlfriend, Ayano. So, the first big fight scene in the series involves a tsundere and a yandere fighting over a boy at the same time as they're fending off a pack of wild demon dogs, which is not only hilarious, but also a phenomenal example of how to establish character dynamics through dynamic action. This is seriously one of the most fun to watch shows this season. If you like your fights with a big ol' side of banter and some modestly sized demon anime titty for garnish, consider engaging with Engage Kiss. On, or hopefully in the other hand, if you're the sort of connoisseur who will only accept anime demon titty that is also of the big ol' variety, then Vermeil in Gold will likely be more to your liking. Or you, you could enjoy both anime. Most people will probably do that one. The big ol' things in question come stapled to the front of Vermeil, a mighty, ancient, and very very naughty demoness who's been imprisoned in a magical tome for centuries on account of said naughtiness. Vermeil finds herself freed from that prison by one Alto Goldefield, an innocent, iramacoon esque soft boy of a magic school honor student whose inexplicable inability to summon any other kind of familiar puts him at risk of repeating a grade on a technicality. So, like any honor student would, he sold his soul to a devil to to save his GPA. As devils go, though, Vermeil is certainly on the softer, less horrifying side of the spectrum, not to mention the friendlier side. Very friendly. And willing and eager to point out that other familiars are totally allowed to sit on their master's laps in class. She's a lot of fun. Alto's innocent reactions to the whole ordeal are even funner, and, of course, the reaction of his pink twin tail tsundere childhood friend is the funnest of all, especially since Vermeil's vast magic power happens to require constant infusions of his unusually potent mana, which you can probably guess how she extracts that from him. I told you it wasn't a new concept. But ask yourself, does it really need to be new when the magic being fueled is so Sakuga-tastic, plus also hot demon mommy in Black Virgin Killer? I didn't think so. Besides, there can be value in even the most played out of ideas if they're executed well enough, and that would be a great transition to this summer's obligatory isekai recommendation if the languidly titled but surprisingly fast-paced My Isekai Life, I Gained a Second Character Class and Became the Strongest Sage in the World had actually made the cut. Instead, it was ever so slightly edged out of the running by the far more original and intriguing Parallel World Pharmacy. Which, to be fair, doesn't exactly sound like a very original or intriguing title at all. Why, exactly one summer ago today, I was declaring Drugstore in Another World to be the most 5 out of 10 anime of that 
particular month. But despite their virtually identical titles, Parallel World Pharmacy really couldn't be more different. For starters, its protagonist is a real rarity in Isekai, a fully capable adult who led a quite fulfilling and successful life back on Earth as a world-famous medical researcher before he worked himself to death at an early age trying to cure the disease that took his little sister. On the other side, in the other world, 31-year-old Kanji Yakutani awakens in the freshly lightning-struck body of 10-year-old Pharma de' Medici, educated heir to a respected medieval medical dynasty, and according to the maid he asks to fill in the gaps in his memory, something of a prodigy in the divine art of water, which is kinda like water magic, only they call it something different. Though whatever abilities he used to have pale in comparison to what he can do now, as the world's god of medicine himself has also taken up residence in Pharma's young body, granting him the power to instantly diagnose any illness and create or destroy any substance whose chemical composition he can imagine. Which is a lot of substances, because he has the chemistry education of a 21st century doctor. That education also clues him into the fact that this medieval fantasy world's concept of medicine is kinda, well, medieval. Only the rich can afford it, and it mostly consists of, like, leeches and snake oil, so our young hero sets out to save the world not by felling some demon king, but by revolutionizing healthcare and making it available to the masses. That is a pretty based premise, and the OP promises he's gonna have to do some gnarly wizard duels to make it happen too, which is awesome. I mean, I like it when characters do like complicated political stuff, but wizard duels are cool. I wanna watch a wizard duel. Sorry, was I rambling there? I, I should probably move on to the next show, huh? But, ah, uh, okay, look. I know my stepmom's daughter is my ex sounds like a certain kind of anime. And make no mistake, this show does go from zero to uh-oh step bro in 15 minutes flat. But it's the way it gets there that makes it worth watching. Because while the title makes it sound like that certain kind of thing, and it certainly is that kind of thing, it's also, secretly, a horny B-movie knockoff of Kaguya-sama Love is War. And even a cheap knockoff of that show is gonna be pretty fun. See, Mizuto and Yume Irido, our step-twin protagonists, were a pair of unpopular dorks in middle school who spent many an evening together in the library after school until the canoodling gave way to arguing and ultimately they parted ways at graduation, then went on to make their high school debuts as the cool, capable top students of the same prestigious private academy. But unfortunately, their plans for a comfortable high school life hit a hitch when their folks got hitched, and now they have to come home every night to the one face from school they want to see the absolute least. And to make matters even worse, they were born on the same day within 30 minutes of each other, so they can't even settle who must suffer the indignity of calling the other One or Onisan. To solve this dilemma, the pair make a wager. Obviously, the older sibling has to be the one most capable of leading both of them as members of the family, the one who best understands how to be a family and can thus serve as an example to the other. By the same token, then, whichever one of them can't see past their past relationship to make this new one work must be the younger sibling. Therefore, the only fair way for these two high IQ student prodigies to settle their differences is to put all of their wit and talent into an epic winner-takes-all game of incest chicken. Because as we all know, in love, whoever uh-ohs first loses. So is my stepmom's daughter is my ex as smart, charming, deep, strategic, or character-rich as Kaguya-sama? Are you kidding? Did you see the feature-length video essay I just put out about that show? N no, not even close. But you and I both know how hard you laughed when I said incest chicken just now, and isn't that what really matters at the end of the day? If you said yes to that question, then I've got one more isekai anime you need to check out this season. Or wait, is it reverse isekai? Or... Reverse, reverse isekai? Maybe post isekai? 
the semantics don't matter. Uncle from Another World tells the tale of a nerdy Japanese 20-something named Takafumi who's tasked with taking care of his newly awakened nerdy uncle who's been stuck in a coma for 17 years after meeting Truck-kun one fateful day. Oji-san hasn't just been lying around for all that time, though. I mean, his body has, but his spirit was busy saving the population of another world from demons and monsters and shit. A thoroughly ungrateful population of impossibly hot fantasy anime people who frequently mistook his average Japanese geek looks for the product of an unconscionable union between man and orc. Not everyone saw him that way, of course. He did save a lot of lives, including that of a very pretty elf girl, but having been isekai'd a few years before the tsundere trope really hit the mainstream in Japan, Oji-san was tragically unable to spot the difference between her and the haters. It wasn't all bad, though. He did amass quite the arsenal of rare magical artifacts and powerful spells on his journey to save the world, and he was able to bring it all with him on the return trip, which of course proves quite useful in our mundane modern society. I mean, just think of the viral video potential. Though, of course, before Oji-san can think of that, his nephew has to explain to him what a viral video even is. Plus, catch him up on the rest of the last two decades of Japanese history that he missed out on. History that, sadly, includes the tragic, too-soon demise of Oji-san's first and only true love. Sega game consoles. Sony Parodies of the isekai genre are a dime a dozen, and most of them aren't even worth that, but from what I've seen, Uncle from Another World has the potential to be the best since Konosuba. Its geek jokes are on point, its genre parody is genuinely incisive and original, and it looks at the isekai premise from an angle we really haven't seen before, which is not a sentence I thought I'd be saying in the year 2022. And with that, we have officially reached the end of the ones to watch for this summer. That's right, I just talked about every anime I possibly could have talked about, except, of course, for the maid I hired recently is mysterious, because that starts airing after my cutoff date, and obviously while I have read the manga and I know that the manga is good, I can't talk to how good the anime is unless I've seen the anime. But other than that, I definitely didn't forget anything. <laughs> Tokyo Mew Mew, aka Mew Mew Power, is a magical girl anime from back in the four kids jelly donut days with a slightly educational environmentalist twist. Each of the five color-coded Mew Mews draws their alien fighting powers not from magic or space or whatever, but rather from the DNA of endangered animals whose burning desire to survive against the odds awakens each Mew's fighting instincts. So obviously there's no giant panda Mew since they're perfectly happy to not fuck themselves to death. This cult classic magical girl franchise has been rebooted in 2022 as Tokyo Mew 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 with tastefully modernized character designs and sakuga-laden transformation sequences that will hopefully 